Good evening. My name is Kent Dix, CEO of Light365. Welcome to our eighth in a series of webinars related to COVID-19, telehealth, and remote patient monitoring. Before I introduce our panelists this evening, I want to take a minute and thank all the healthcare providers, first responders, family caregivers, home health care workers, child care providers, food and grocery delivery, transportation, healthcare manufacturers, and many others. Thank you all for your service. I also want to take uh, let you know that everyone will be on mute and then we'll accept questions via chat and try to entertain a few questions throughout the webinar. We have reserved some time for questions at the end. Uh, at the end, if you um, don't get, if we don't get your questions, we'll answer them after the webinar and post a recorded video on light365.health or our website, www.newnormal.buzz tomorrow. Now I wanna take a minute to introduce our distinguished panelists and have them provide a quick 30 to 60 second introduction. First is Dr. David Shulkin, ninth secretary of the US Department of Veterans Affairs, serving under President Trump and the Under Secretary of Health serving under President Obama. Welcome, David. And if you want to introduce yourself, that would be great. Kent, I just think you did it for me. So thank you. I appreciate that introduction and appreciate you hosting us today and look forward to the discussion. So I'm going to use my time and pass it on to my colleagues. Great. Thank you. And I, and I saw you on CNN today and, I, and you've been doing a great job informing us on COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, the next person is Dr. Uh, Nick Vanderheden, uh, who is a leader in innovation and incremental disruption in uh, digital health and sustainable innovation. Nick? Thanks, Ken. Um, appreciate the in, uh, invitation and joining you. Uh, looking forward to the discussion and always a delight to uh, join my colleagues, both uh, uh, David and uh, Fred. Um, we're currently working and thinking about this deeply uh, and hope we can share some of those experiences uh, this evening. So thanks for having us. I have to tell you, I've been looking forward to this panel. So there's, I think there's going to be, be some great insights to the to the um, the participants today. The, the last person, but not least, is Fred Goldstein. Uh, is the founder and president of Accountable Health, focusing on population health, health system redesign, and new technology and analytics. Fred. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Kent, and obviously great to be with uh, Nick and David as well, and also wanted to second that introduction you gave to thank all those people out there who are doing unbelievable work to keep us healthy and safe and eating. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I usually do this um, when, before we get into the questions, but I give a couple stats and kind of update them week to week, but uh, we have now topped 5 million people in the world uh, that have been diagnosed with coronavirus COVID-19. And this week alone, uh, the U.S. has topped 1.5 million that have been tested positive with COVID. Uh, and, that's, and that's an increase of 50% uh, in one week. Um, we had 28,000 deaths in the U.S. three weeks ago. And this week, we are expected to reach 100,000 deaths. Uh, 13 million people have been tested to date. I think two weeks ago, it was 5.5 million. And we have 333 million people in the U.S. Uh, communities are starting to open back up. Uh, and the question I have, and David, I'm probably going to throw it to you right away, uh, is are we prepared to go back to work safely? Well, um, you know, first of all, I can't, I can't help but just uh, comment that uh, it's so nice to see everyone recognizing our healthcare workers. That's, uh, that's really terrific, you know, and so many people that have been invisible. And I just had completed a study where we looked at what people who are hospitalized are saying about our healthcare workers, because we see the scenes of the people clapping for them coming to work every day, but, but taking a look at our patients in the hospital, what they think. And it's amazing the amount of positive feedback, the comments that they're writing, the fact that they're recognizing as well. So, uh, but your question's a really good one. And obviously the one that's on everybody's mind today, can we open up safely? Uh, there's an editorial today in the USA Today, which uh, I'm a co-author on, 20 of us uh, who have served in senior levels of government from both the Republican and the Democratic side and those who don't declare what side they're on, like me, uh, all authored that basically said, yes, we can open up safely. And in fact, we have to open up safely. 
uh, that there is no choice but to begin to start opening up. But let's do it thoughtfully. And we outline what it will take to open up safely. And these aren't the high bar barriers. This is just, frankly, good common medical and scientific evidence that suggests that you need to do this in a way that um, does not allow us to put people in an unsafe situation. And when you think about what it's going to take to open up safely, it is what we know that works in this virus. Not that we know everything. I think there's still more we're going to be discovering. But while we know hydroxychloroquine doesn't work in treating COVID infection, what we do know is that the following things will help in opening up safely. Uh, a proper screening procedure uh, by making sure that we can try to the, best of our, to the best knowledge that we can to make sure that people who are infected or may be asymptomatic are not around other people. Good hygiene, making sure that we're washing our hands. Fortunately, this is a virus that is easily destroyed with soap and water. Good testing to make sure that we're using appropriate testing in both the antigen and when appropriate, the antibody. In fact, just today we learned from a South Korean study that antibody looks like it is protective against future infections. We didn't know that before, so that's terrific. Distancing, social distancing. Not that six feet is a magic uh, cure-all, but it's a reasonable distance. Uh, the further that you can be from six feet, it's actually safer since we've seen this, vi this virus travel up to 18 to 20 feet. But six feet is a reasonable distance to be from other people. Using masks, if both the person wearing the mask and the person that they're interacting with is wearing a mask, we can reduce viral transmission by 70%. And then finally, by tracing, when we do identify people who are infected, finding out where they've been and isolating, self-quarantining those people. If we do those steps, I believe we can open up safely. Yeah, I know I'm going to throw out to Nick here in a, in a second. The question I had is, I know we have to go back to work, um, you know, because of our economy, and that's just how we how we make our living a lot. We are actually doing a new normal, and a lot of companies are now coming through and saying, if you can work remotely, you're allowed to work remotely. Um, I think Twitter did it this week, and other people are saying it as well. A lot of people are saying, don't come back for three months or so. Uh, we just want to make sure. The interesting thing, and this is your show, but I want to comment on this, is uh, we're starting to see, and we'll talk about this, a lot of people talking that October, November, December is going to be much worse than what we just experienced, right, as far as the virus is concerned. So are we getting ready to release people back to work in a time frame where they go back and then it actually could get worse, right, from that as well? Like if Twitter says stay at home for the summer for the three months, right? Then you're going to release them right back into the worst time frame. How does that work, right, as a company? Nick, what's your thoughts on that? Well, um, so first off, I just want to amplify the point that David made. You know, we're all looking for hope. I think that's the one thing that I, I certainly seek in all of this. And the piece that I amplify in terms of our capacity to do this is to, to look at the example of what we've done to date around supermarkets. Supermarkets have remained open safely through this period of isolation because they were necessary. And we introduced a series of controls that David uh, outlined, I think, um, uh, that, that essentially helped protect both the employees and also uh, the customers. And we continue to innovate and um, improve. And, and that's where I sort of source the majority of my sort of hope around this in doing so. When we talk about the se sequencing and uh, the, the delay and the possible resurgence, we've seen a little bit of that already as we've opened up some of these states. We've seen a little bit of a bump um, in some of the states. And there's certainly some question as to whether uh, the seasonal variation. The one thing I would say relative to that is if you think about this from a worldwide perspective, there are countries that are warm and hot, which tends to be the, the association that people believe will diminish the virus. Um, and they're still having the same kind of levels of outbreak. So I think we'll see some level of seasonality. And certainly as we expose more people, there's potential 
But if we manage to control that with the guidelines that David outlined clearly, which is testing, um, treatment, tracing, accurately and appropriately, and with the relevance to the individual businesses and the people that are involved, I think we're going to be able to mitigate that so that we don't see this massive bump. I, I think everybody is comparing it to the uh, is it 1918. I forget, forgive me if I get the wrong year, but the, the, the Spanish right. that everybody's talking about and they saw a big bump. We don't necessarily have to see that because we know so much more and we will know much more at that point. Right. And, and so Fred, from your perspective, you know, is, are, is testing going to be something that we have to do on a regular basis with employees? I know my attorney, uh, in their firm, a large firm out there is saying that they want to be tested on, you know, at least a monthly basis, if that makes sense to be able to do. Um, and maybe we're already even getting it wrong. Maybe they don't need to be tested. They need, need to be more about contact tracing and sim you know, symptoms. Uh, do home health care workers have to be tested on a weekly basis to go back and health care workers? Mm -hmm. What about testing? Where does that fit, fit into all this with going back to work? I think from my perspective, and I'll turn that back to Nick and David. It's a, it's a clinical issue, I think, that makes some sense. Um, and along with that, one thing that was sort of raised about whether we repeat that, that I just like to bring up is this fact that after all of this stuff is put in place, it's up to each of us as individuals to actually follow through with these recommendations and either wear a mask or be refusing that or, um, you know, keep our distancing or not. And so it really is a cultural shift that we need to create within employer groups and the, and the communities at large as well as implementing actual policies. But I think you should have either David or Nick talk about whether testing on a monthly basis is the right approach or not. Yeah, I, I, I'd be glad to jump in there. And I think the hard thing to understand for most people is, is that this is a dynamic environment. Mm -hmm. So the answer today, and just to date this, it's May 20th, 2020, <laughs> is going to be very different than the answer in a couple weeks. But the approach that I'm recommending to people right now is to stratify the risk in the community that you're in, that your business is in, that your facility's in, that your people who work are in. And I stratify it into high risk, medium risk, low and very low risk. And the way that you do this is by looking at two factors. The rate of current active infections for every 100,000 residents and the rate of growth or decline of infections over the last 14 days. And using those two factors, I've categorized these every part of the country into these high risk areas. If you're in the very highest risk area where the rates are, in, in, are essentially growing, two states right now are growing, uh, or in a area where you have more than 100,000 where you have more than 100 cases per every 100,000 residents, you should be testing on a regular and frequent basis. New York State now mandates that if you work in nursing homes in New York State, you have to, you have to test twice a week. That's wow. the state law right now. Now, if you're in a medium area, you can back that down to once a month. If you're in a low area, you can back that down to essentially every few months. If you're in a very, very low area, you can test after a baseline of your employees just when they potentially develop symptoms or when there's an exposure. So I think the answer is, is that we're gonna have to be tracking the incidence of this infection on a daily basis and changing those recommendations on the testing frequency by the community that you live in and by the recent outbreaks that may or may not be happening. So Nick, I think Frank, you, yeah. you would talk to this as well, which, uh, it, you know, it's, it's the, 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 the risk in each of the different circumstances. So depending on your particular business or industry will vary the level of testing or the risk that you essentially fall into. And that will drive some of this as well, correct? And, and David brings up a good point about geogra geographic location. So knowing where your employees live is also extremely important because they could be living in a certain community that suddenly has a higher outbreak. As you see in these various, looking up by zip code, et cetera, as some of these mapping services are now providing, to take a look at that data and understand 
oh, I have a couple employees who may be in a higher risk area that are coming to work here. I happen to be in a lower risk area and I need to understand that and then apply uh, a system like David's talking about. So Nick, walk me through this really quickly. I'm, I am an employer, right? I am the, the leader of the company uh, from that perspective. And I want to now bring my employees back to work. As an employer uh, for my company, what are the things that I need to think about to make sure that my employees feel safe? To, safe. Do I have, obviously I have an ethical responsibility. Do I have a moral responsibility? Do I have a legal responsibility uh, to make sure that those employees that are coming back are tested, are safe? Is, does, am I allowed to be able to take a temperature from them and not allow them to come back to work? Walk me through how you would guide an employer to make their environment safe for their employees. Yeah, so I, I think I start with the, the, the basis that every uh, company requires some COVID-19 coordinator that is the focal point. And in small companies, that may end up being the CEO. It may end up being sort of senior executives. But it's a function of somebody that is taking on the responsibility to David's point, which is keeping up with the changes. As he said, it's, it's today. It, it's shocking that we're talking in these terms, but you know, two weeks from now, this advice could be different. So first point is to have somebody that's there as a resource that you can answer uh, and, and seek the right level of information that's relevant to your industry. So customizing to your industry. I know Fred will talk to this in a second as we sort of walk through the various steps that we have. Um, but it starts with that coordinator assessing the level of risk and then I think importantly, and you, you highlighted this in your question, which is how do I deliver uh, that level of comfort? And sometimes that comfort needs to come from outside. One of the things that's been very clear to me is most organizations don't have the resources or capability to have a medical director or somebody that oversees it. It's just not been a function that's available unless you're in a very large industry and even then, sometimes not. Having that resource at least available externally that can validate, can help answer questions and provide that um, so that people have comfort. The whole liability is a separate issue. I'd like Fred to sort of talk about that, but um, fr from a, just a pure trust issue, having external validation and support to allow you to step through that so that you feel like you're being, um, uh, you're delivering the best possible advice at the time um, is the sort of central aspect to that. Fred, do you want to talk about the, the legal issues around this? Well, you can take temperatures, obviously, but one of the things to recognize if you're doing a survey or taking a temperature of an individual is that those results, if you're storing any of that, is HIPAA. You have to keep that private. And there are some questions about you know, how do you do this to preserve the privacy of the individual that's coming into your facility so that you can go ahead and, you know, if, if they have a high temperature, you know, does everyone know that? Those kinds of things. It's, it's a tricky issue. It's important for people to also talk to legal and EEOC, et cetera. There are some issues around that as well. Particularly, I think there was a question up about should you stratify tactics according to employee risk? Well, you have certain employees who are more vulnerable. You need to understand that and hopefully they'll, they self-disclose and you then have set up an appropriate way to either make it safe for them to show up to work or understand possibly why they're not coming in because of that vulnerability. Or even better, just... facilitate them from not showing up and allowing right. them to be one of the sort of more permanent telehealth workers without revealing that condition. I mean, it's a really shaky area, but ultimately I think with the best intentions, it's possible to navigate this appropriately. Yeah, I was just thinking about that. You know, it's not only we're gonna start doing HIPAA in world and, and employers that don't deal with HIPAA, right, on a regular basis, uh, meat packing plants, right, that are out there in their employees. They're not typically around HIPAA regulations on a regular basis and understanding what's confidential and what's not confidential from that as well. Um, so I think it's a whole new world of exposure as well. You don't necessarily wanna go around and start pointing at people saying, that person has COVID or that person doesn't have COVID uh, because that could start violating a lot of rights in HIPAA and, you know, potentially uh, their employment with the job and, and, and such as well. What, so what, 
um, guidance would you give to an employer? You know, we talked about making their, their environment safe, but what responsibility does the employer have? Are they, are, are they allowed to ask uh, an employee to test if they feel like they are, are subject to having COVID-19 or a temperature? Can they refuse them from coming to work um, or making them sit, you know, six feet apart or whatever if they're in the break room Right, and they don't go through and they don't sit six feet apart from their colleagues. Is that an actionable offense with an employer or is this just all new ground right now? Well, you know, I think that um, you may be asking legal questions that, that, uh, that probably people should be asking their attorneys, but, but I, will, I will answer that with the experience that I have. Uh, having sure. run many large organizations as the chief executive, uh, I've had to do exactly that. So the example in healthcare has been whether you can mandate influenza vaccines for your healthcare workers. And the belief being that if you don't, that you may be spreading influenza to your patients, many of whom are immunocompromised or to other coworkers. So I have taken the position as most healthcare organizations have now, that you cannot enter and continue to work in a hospital unless you get an influenza vaccine. Now, if you have a medical reason for not being able to get a vaccine, then you'd have to wear a mask even pre-COVID. So I think the equivalent is beginning to happen now in this new world. Originally, the EEOC had said that you cannot take a temperature as an employer. They have changed that and said the employer has a right to take a temperature. Mm -hmm. And that same factor is probably going to happen with testing and social distancing and wearing a mask. And in fact, if an employer does not take those actions, they are likely to face legal issues as well. Today, we saw McDonald's that has kept many of their stores open and released a 50 page manual on how to appropriately bring their stores back to work was sued by their employee groups because they felt that it wasn't a safe environment. So I think, and my advice to employers is you should err on the side of doing what's right to protect your staff and your customers and worry about legal consequences as a secondary matter. Yeah, another that was that up, was another question. Another thing, Go ahead, Fred. Yeah, one other thing to consider with this that I don't think people have thought much about, as we've seen around the country, there are instances where people get a little bit agitated by some of this stuff, and it's happening a lot more than we know. Probably a lot not at that quite a high level as we've seen the news, but it's probably important for certain companies to have somebody inside who has learned some de-escalation techniques. Yeah, and understands how to de-escalate individuals when they're upset. Um, that they can't come in or bring their child into the clinic because they have to wear a mask. And we're seeing some of those things and setting up a clear policy about that, that it flows to somebody who knows how to deal with a situation like that is probably an important thing to begin considering. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's I, one. I, I, I just ahead. have one additional thought around that. And it's, it, it's almost trivial, but I'm reminded of it because I'm wearing a jacket. But I've been to the restaurant where they've insisted on a jacket. That was years ago. And that was frustrating, but what did they do? They had a jacket for me, albeit it was awful on me, let's be clear, but it's the same with masks and having those policies, having the compassion around those policies to try and help people and support them through it, I think makes for a more understanding experience and allows people to sort of be more accepting in this new, new environment we all live in. Well, and I think, I think that these points are really excellent. And I think that it is also important to really focus on communicating why you're taking certain actions. And employers can really do a lot to help themselves by having town hall meetings, by allowing people to ask questions and to hearing how other people, their, their coworkers respond. Because many people believe that people are wearing masks to protect themselves. Well, the reality is, um, they're really not wearing masks to protect themselves. They're wearing masks to protect other people. And if you take a look at the data, and I'm talking about the loose fitting cloth masks at this point, or even the triple layer paper masks, they block about 70% of virus that's being spewed outwards towards other people. But because they're not airtight, they don't block 
uh, the majority of virus that could come inward. So the only masks that would really block or protect a person would be an airtight mask or what we call the N95 masks or respirators. And so you're wearing a mask to protect your coworkers, to protect the people that you're taking care of, your customers uh, and your family. And um, it really is a, it's really a social consideration to be doing that. Absolutely. Makes makes sense to me. So one of the things that, you know, was put out there as well, we talked about quarantines that are going out, we're releasing kind of people back to their jobs right now, we want to do it safely. We've talked to you've talked about tiers, like maybe there's tiers of releases, depending on the outbreaks that are in yep. a community that's out there. New York City is trying, you know, going down, you know, maybe they can, the most vulnerable population probably shouldn't be out and among it right now. But maybe people that are healthy and maybe people that have been tested. Do we wait to increase that level of a release uh, until the antigen tests come? And what do we know about the antigen tests that are out there? That was one of the questions that came through. Nick, do you want to take that or? or, or yeah, uh, uh, I, absolutely. Okay. So um, David talked about testing as part of that strategy. Two basic tests, PCR or, or a virus, let's call it a virus test for simplicity. So we're looking for fragments of the virus, the indications that you have the virus and it's in your body. Uh, we do so by taking samples from the back of the throat, uh, the nose, sometimes with saliva. Um, and uh, that test can be uh, delayed, so it can take several hours or sometimes in the early days, it was taking even longer that, sometimes days for it to come back. There are now some uh, accelerated versions. Those essentially indicate that you have the infection, even if you're asymptomatic. Um, the antibody test is a test uh, that is designed to look for the antibodies that uh, show up as a result of having had the infection. Uh, there are two phases of that and two sorts, but we look for the longer term version of that. And right now, we don't know for sure if that antibody test confers you a level of immunity that says you've had the virus, you have the antibodies, and therefore can't for sure get it again. But our best understanding, and certainly based on uh, the emerging data, and also historical data relative to coronavirus, suggests that if you've had the infection and you show the antibody response, and it's the right antibody, so we've got to be specific to COVID-19, not to all coronaviruses, and that's one of the other challenges with these tests. But assuming that, that accuracy is appropriate, we think that confers some level of immunity, and it may extend to months. It could be longer than that. It may be shorter than that. And that will offer us some capacity to say, we'll test you with the antibody testing. And once we understand the duration uh, of that immunity, we can say, we don't need to test you again for that period of time. So one of the things that, you know, I think you, Nick, it's you, but also Fred as well, you mentioned uh, before about the three T's, right, that are out there, testing and tracing and treatment, right? How does that uh, pertain to safely going back to work, especially explaining a little bit to me about, you know, contact tracing right, as well? Yeah, so it, uh, it, it raises this interesting issue that came up a little bit before when you were talking about taking the temperature and, uh, you know, requiring your employees or your visitors and the challenges with that from a, a privacy standpoint. And the same is true with tracing. So one of the things that uh, we've seen um, with contact tracing, this already happened in New Zealand, so it's a... a, a um, there was a restaurant that was doing appropriate story or not appropriate. They were capturing the contacts of people that have visited the restaurant. And one of the employees used that to essentially stalk a lady um, uh, inappropriately. Well, the original intent was appropriate because you need that contact information because if you discover that one of your employees or one of the visitors to your store had COVID-19, you would want to be able to communicate to those individuals. So managing this in a form that allows you to trace people without breaking confidence or trust, more importantly, is going to be one of the challenges going forward. We just don't have a really good model for that at this point in time. 
the public tracing suffers from the same problem because any question and answer process that people do for contact tracing is really invasive. We're asking all sorts of very detailed questions about your interactions, places you've gone and so forth. And it creates this tension between privacy and people's desire for keeping their lives and activities um, personal and private. But from a, a corporation standpoint, you want to do the right thing to allow for the communication of information quickly to your customers and to your employees when you detect uh, a case in your particular um, environment. Yeah, that's. I was thinking when you were saying that about data breaches, right, that are out there and you have to alert people immediately if there's a data breach from that and have remedies as well. Are we heading, are we heading there as well, potentially? Uh, that if somebody has come in and has COVID-19 that's been tested for it, that we immediately have to notify our employees that you've been exposed potentially to COVID-19 if they're coming back. I mean, there's a moral and ethical part of it. Is there, I guess I'm sorry, I don't have an attorney on the panel today, but is there a legal responsibility to start notifying people? And by the way, does it, is it a liability because you notified people as well, right? From that, well, because you don't, you don't have the responsibility to do it. Legally. Put the liability to one side for a second and say, what's the medical or clinical responsibility? Well, the clinical responsibility is to contact, trace, and alert those people so that they can, at a minimum, self-isolate and stop the spread and drop the R naught that everybody, I hope, understands at this point down below uh, one and you know heading towards zero. You do that by contact tracing, self-isolating to make sure that you don't continue the spread. That right. uh, just besides the point from a legal standpoint. Now, does that compete with you know people's individual rights? It may well do. So how we achieve that and how we do that in the framework of our current sort of legal infrastructure, employee relationship, and some of the uh, regulations is going to be very challenging. But you know, I think Fred said it. Do it with the best intentions. I think, and also David, a question maybe for you on this. As the public health departments ramp up this contact tracing, they're trying to bring in a lot of staff. And I know there's some training programs out now that Hopkins has out to quickly train people to contact trace. Will they be doing the majority of this as an, for an employer coming in and say, hey, I, we I think people are gonna be sorely disappointed if they're gonna be waiting for the public health officials. Uh, the cities in, across this country are devastated financially. Their tax bases are eroded. So I think that what many cities are doing is they're announcing that they would like to have a program, but they're waiting for federal funding. And unless somebody else is gonna pay the bill, they're not going to have these armies of people around. So the responsibility is gonna fall clearly back onto the employer, to the university, to the organization to be able to do this. And I think one has to plan on an effective contact tracing program which means that somebody should be taking a look at some of this information in their company to say, how might I do that? What are the questions I need to ask? Who do I take it to? How do I identify who they've spoken with or come in contact with to begin to trace those things out? Yeah. Well, I think, I think the new normal is, is that anybody who is going to be on site in your facilities, you're going to have to know who that is and be responsible for them. Now, I'm not talking about a customer who comes in to pick up a hamburger or to buy a pair of jeans. Because what we do know about this virus is, is that the contagion of the virus is also dependent upon the length of the exposure. But if you have people who are gonna be in your facility who are working there, contact, uh, contract labor or vendors who are gonna be spending their time there, you should know who's in your building. You should know something about the status of their, uh, you know, ability to be infectious and you should have a record of that should you need to contact them at a later point. Mm -hmm. I, I do have a little bit of concern because I, there's this growing kind of tension and it's been growing ever since everybody's been isolated that's out there. I understand the tension, but there are some very anti-maskers, right, that are out there. There are people that don't believe this is real. Uh, from that perspective, they are employed. Right. Uh, there was a story that came out yesterday of the Reverend and his wife that were in Arkansas that actually thought the God would take the virus away. And they actually infected 62 in the congregation and four died from that right. as well. Right. So, you know, how do we re still respect people's rights right. and beliefs, right. right? That are out there 
and still make them part of our functional employment team with us. Yeah, but Kent, this is not new behavior. So, yeah. so, so you know, we've dealt with this with people who've refused to not smoke inside, you know, restaurants and bars originally, people who refused to wear helmets for motorcycles, use seat belts, people who essentially uh, refused to get vaccines for their children and then continue to spread measles and, and other types of preventable diseases. So this is behavior that we've seen before. You need to deal with it the way that societies deal with it. And, uh, you know, frankly, the American people have been very, very uh, well behaved, I think, and have really taken this seriously, have social distance in general. The media likes to focus on those that are doing sort of the, you know, outrageous behaviors, and that's always going to be the case. But, you know, social pressure, and certainly I do believe, as I said before, employers will be able to say that you cannot continue to work. You will not be able to enter the workforce if you refuse to follow the norms that we've set for people's safety and uh, set that standard. So I think, I think we will get through that part of it. it sometimes, as Fred said, uh, may take some de-escalation strategies because some of these people are very strong-minded, but I think it's going to be a small minority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to me when I see a city like New York City and see the powerhouse of 20 million people that are in that city at any one time during the working day and to basically be shut down. So your comment, right, about people are pretty well behaved to be able to take a city like New York, mm -hmm. a financial powerhouse like that and contain everybody to their home uh, is a big testament uh, to people as well. And you're right, uh, people are, for the most part, being very well behaved. From that well, as well. Well, well, I certainly remember when um, you know we saw China go through this. I think everybody's comments were, well, you know, you could you can shut down Wuhan, but you could never do that in New York City. You know, I mean, this is America. Americans would never stand for it. And in fact, we have seen Americans have done this without being forced. There aren't armed guards outside their doors. They're doing it because they understand that this is the way that you have to deal with this virus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's the good news, go ahead. Is, the go ahead, Fred. good news about some of this is as we've learned more and the science comes out, we suddenly realize, well, outdoor activities with appropriate spacing are okay. You know, big concerts, well, that's probably out for a while. And that whole risk uh, idea that, that David was talking about and understanding those various risks is critical to as we reopen, which areas are, are, are easier to do, which types of events you're not going to be able to do, and begin to allow people to expand their activities in a safe and appropriate manner. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting what we're, you know, what we're experiencing right now. Myself, you know, our team working, you know, probably remotely for the last seven or eight weeks um, is the new normal. It is something that we go through and we're, we're actually going through and probably defining a new way of doing business together and how we communicate. Uh, so I think new models, new, you know, new economics of how we develop our economy and stuff is all being, is all being done right now in front of us, right? New models from that. And employers not only have to get used to you know, how employees are coming back and stuff like that, but they're also having to get used to how they're doing business in the future too, right? With teams over Zoom and everything else with it as well. Nick, how would you, how would you coach, you know, um, employees that are going back to work, right? And trying to be productive, you know, citizens as well, uh, being part of this as well. So I, I, I think my, my primary goal in, in terms of how you approach the new environment we're in is not to replicate what you've got today. The, the, we want to innovate and transform. And I'll, I'll use electronic medical records as a case in point. What did we do? We took paper records and we digitized them. And you know everybody's discovered that that's a very poor uh, model for the digital record. The same is true for this new virtual working environment. And I would say that, that the first thing you start with is rethink that whole process. So part of that rethought in uh, business, and your case uh, as, as an example, is you have different groups that maybe um, get together at different times. So if you have a large organization, maybe you stagger or stage people at different times so that you can reduce the number of people. Do you need to have everybody in all of the time? Is it certain days, certain teams? 
how do you effectively use these tools? One of the things about Zoom that you know bothers me most of all is that a, a meeting in person is not the same when you have it in Zoom. This is a very different interaction and you have to adapt to this new uh, environment. So shorten the meetings, make use of these um, uh, other tools that we have like Slack for online interactions, uh, email is still very useful. Um, so I think the adaptation is important and importantly from a, an employee and employer is it's the give and take. It's the, the process of understanding what the new environment is and adapting and seeing how best to fit in so that it can work for everybody concerned. So Fred, from the, your perspective on this, where, where can we an, engage employees and employers differently in the future? One of them that I'll just throw out there really quickly is telehealth, right, from that. You know, are there new tools that we can give to employees, right, to allow them to be more comfortable in their job and to engage in their job, especially with the new normal? Yeah, I think the first step is actually just communicating with them in an appropriate way so that they can understand if you are bringing them back, it is safe. Here's the things we've done and put in place to ensure that you feel good coming back to work and can interact with the clients or customers or where we have and put in tools that can help educate your employees about things like that. I think then as you look at other tools, I mean, there are all kinds of things you can do, but at the end of the day, um, Technology is going to take you so far, but it's going to have to be a cultural change too. So people get used to a new way to do work and feel comfortable in that new way. There may have to be new training programs in your organization and things like that. You may reassign responsibilities. Some of this stuff may move to AI based document scanning even or things like that that allow you to distribute stuff. So there are a lot of things to look at, but you really need to take your own industry and say, here's how, here's what we do at our work. How do we safely redo this in the new age? And if there are tools available, what are they and how do we bring them in? But it's a process to go through to understand each of those pieces so your employees feel comfortable and you can bring them, bring them back. Makes, makes sense. Hey, Dr. Shulkin, one of the things I was going to ask you um, is, you know, it's interesting. A lot of us, and I'll say this um, uh, tongue in cheek a little bit, have gotten a break over the last six or eight weeks to get outside our normal. Uh, I, I don't know about you, but I've actually felt like I've been able to do more work being at home and being more focused, even though I'm up at seven and you know working till seven or eight o'clock at night and on a call, how do the healthcare workers get a break, right? If they if they are go or the first responders, if they are going to see this wave that potentially comes in the fall, how do they get a break from this, right? From what they do every single day. Well, it's a great it's a great question, um, and I've only heard that question from one other person who was the CEO of a Fortune 25 company who I thought that's why he's a CEO of a Fortune 25 co company because he's worrying about his people and understanding the impact this is having. So um, I think one of the things that we know from every pandemic is that the toll on the people that are taking care of people, the healthcare workers, is not only considerable. Remember, at the peak of a pandemic, up to 40% of the workforce does not come to work because they themselves are sick, they're taking care of people, or because of their fear of going into work. And if you take a look at, even in the COVID crisis, with the Chinese healthcare workers, when they had a instrument of a mental health instrument given to them, a 17-point scale, 96% of the Chinese healthcare workers displayed symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And what we know from the SARS and the MERS pandemics is that that stress, that post-traumatic stress syndrome exists in many healthcare workers a year after the pandemic goes away. So this is a long lasting impact that is both psychologically and physically exhausting for healthcare workers. The only real antidote to that, antidote to that, is what we are seeing, which is the gratitude and recognition that people have. Because healthcare workers are largely driven by mission. And this is reconnecting many healthcare workers with why they went into healthcare in the first place. People need them and people appreciate them. 
So I do think that this toll on our healthcare workers is going to be significant. I think there's going to be a lot of people that aren't going to come back from this. They're going to retire. They're burned out. They're just not going to be able to re-enter their environments. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think those that do go on are going to be motivated and continue to seek that type of recognition and gratitude. And just by thanking people, we saw this with our military. When our military got back from Vietnam and they were treated as uh, essentially combatants in their own country. But when our military came back from the post 9-11 wars, what do we say? We say, thank you for your service and they're treated with respect. And that morale is so motivating for people that are mission driven. So I think this is a really important factor and particularly if you run a healthcare organization, understanding this is one of the key factors that you as a leader should be focused on the psychological safety, the morale of your staff. Uh, that's really what's gonna bring us through this next year. Yeah, it was, it was empowering to see, at least here in Arizona, nurses that are standing in the middle of a crosswalk, right? Um, and I think it can happen in Wisconsin too, um, that were kind of standing up and kind of reminding some of the protesters that were out there, people that wanted to be out, I understand their feelings. Uh, but they're passionate enough to go out there and remind people uh, that they're putting their lines on the life, their lives on the line every single day, right? For mm -hmm. this as well. Yeah. Uh, the other mm -hmm. thing is, I know that we've been reaching out. This is what came to me at the very beginning, going thing, saying if some of these people are going to retire or some of these people are going to burn out, the benefit, and this is a little, little self-serving, of a telehealth or telemedicine platform, is that we don't have to take retired nurses and doctors and move them back into a COVID environment. We can actually have them sit at the desk right here and work yeah. for advice uh, for 20, 30, 40 people, help their community through technology to be able to do that. And they're there with their brains, right, to try to do, they don't have to be exposed from that. We're fortunate enough to have a great partner, which is AMR Ambulance. And it's unfortunate that AMR has actually have over 2,000 ambulance drivers and paramedics that are in quarantine because they're rushing in. Wow right, uh, that um, to be able to take people to the hospital or to stabilize in some way. So sure. they're putting their lives on the line. They're putting their children's life on the line as well. And that's, that's part of the thing as an employer that we have to think about is how do we protect not only our employees, but our families, right, as well, and our friends yep. as well with this. Absolutely. Nick, any, uh, I know we're getting short on time a little bit, but I really want you to kind of chime in and and just kind of guide us through a little bit. Yeah, so I, I want to pick up a couple of the questions that showed up in the Q&A. Um, one that uh, talked about the education and uh, in, uh, of employees on uh, specific protocols, expectations, and so forth. Um, the challenge of that with, you know, distributed workforce. And, you know, obviously in this particular instance, technology is your friend. I mean, this is a great forum. I know David has run a number of these um, with uh, employers where uh, he actually gets on with the employers and helps uh, answer questions in a sort of uh, model of a town hall um, and very effective. And I think, you know, it, it runs pretty smoothly with the Q&A and, you know, focusing on the questions. So that's one of the ways to approach that. I think it's important to educate and it's not just education, it's part of the trust because if people get to ask questions about the protocols and procedures. And then the other question, and I'm going to turn it to you, David, and see what you have to say about this, but um, is the, the question about data and the fact that much of the planning is based on data that's being received uh, in the States that seems to be days, weeks late. It's, you know, behind the times. Um, and, you know, how should employers deal with that? Is that going to change? Are we going to have a better sort of... Um, reporting mechanism that can help them as part of their sort of planning process? And is there other data that's potentially better for planning purposes? Hmm. Well, I do think that we are, as, as testing is getting better and we're getting more towards what I would call rapid testing and we're gonna have results, um, I believe soon with being able to do home testing. Um, we should get better access to data in the community. So I, I, 
I think that will help. I mean, the lag that we saw early on when testing was both really in limited supply and would take up to seven days to get a result, I think created many of the problems that we had to, um, that led to us closing the economy down. And I think in retrospect, I think there'll be a lot of people really questioning whether uh, we could have avoided this from happening in the first place, whether we really needed to be uh, in the position that we are now, if we had just known more about who actually had this virus and if we could have isolated them sooner. All right. So I, I want to go around really quickly, Fred, from your perspective, because I think we have a, you know, a few minutes left. Um, where do you where do you think that the, uh, we're going right from this? This is why I kind of always ask from your perspective. Where do you think we're going over the next 12 or 18 months? Let's relate it back to employers. Let's relate it back to um, employees and isolation. Where do you think we're going over the next 12 or 18 months? What's your thoughts? Well, I think if we do this right, is the folks point out in the article David mentioned when we started, and we, we have a good strategy about opening up various places. I think with tracing, et cetera, we'll be able to quickly identify this individual got infected. They've contacted these people. We isolate those off and we're able to slowly expand that realm of opening more and more things. Do we get to where concerts are open with the, you know, 50,000 people in a stadium? Maybe not. But other things I think are clearly showing, whether it's the supermarkets, restaurants, outdoors. In Florida here has been open for a while now, and we aren't seeing a huge spike or anything yet. Um, so I think we're beginning to learn what we can do, and we will be able to safely reopen certain businesses if we look at each one and look at their specific risks and that community risk, as David talked about. You know, it's, it's interesting when, uh, when I was listening to employers that are out there that have reopened you know, maybe over the last week or so, what was very, very important to consumers was the fact that they looked like they were protecting the consumer, mm -hmm. that they were going around the grocery store or the restaurant and wiping down things constantly, wearing masks, wearing PPE uh, or gloves that's, uh, that's out there. Um, is, that, is that an important strategy in your book as far as how the consumer feels or how the employee feels when they go back to their workplace so they feel comfortable. I think that's going to be critical, especially for getting people to come back. They have to say that place is going to be safe. I can tell you, I went to a, a pet supermarket really early on during this, and they had essentially closed their store to where two people walked in the front max. They walked through the facility and grabbed your dog food or whatever and brought it to the front. And then you went out. And I said to myself, I'm comfortable coming here. And this was six weeks ago, eight weeks ago. And so I think those kinds of things are going to be how you create your business going forward is to be able to communicate with your customers that we have a place that we're truly worried about you and our employees' safety. Do you think that's going to stay with us for quite a while? Right from that, Fred, do you think? Is if that, we do is it long that... enough, it'll become ingrained in our culture, which is probably yeah. what we need until we get to some sort of a vaccine or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. It's interesting. Nick, I'll go over to you really quickly and ask what you see, you know, for the next 12 or 18 months. Really, I got an email this week that said, listen, you know, Ken, your series shouldn't be called the new normal because you're just creating a chicken little effect. And this is all going to go back to the way it was before when the COVID-19 has gone. I don't, I don't believe that. I believe that, obviously, I don't believe that. I believe that what COVID-19 did for us is accelerate where we're going anyway, accelerating how we're working with healthcare professionals, accelerating how we consume, you know, whether it's, um, you know, food or whether it's, you know, um, whether it's media or, or, or whatever else that's out there as well, that we're just accelerating the in in inevitable how consumers want to consume. So from your standpoint, where are we at in 12 to 18 months? Well, I mean, it's a sad fact that we need uh, personal experiences like this to really focus the mind. It's exposed all of the inadequacies, but it's also highlighted all the capabilities and highlighted, you know, the many people that contribute to the, the good of our society, our healthcare system. Um, the, the, I, I don't reference, you know, back to, I think it's whatever the new environment is, it's a watershed moment 
and before and after is neither good nor bad it's just the new environment that we live in we have to adapt that's what we do as human beings and we use as much knowledge and science importantly to drive the best decisions for our society and for the people in it um, you know this has been a very difficult time i think there's certainly some pushback as to you know could we have done nothing certainly somebody asked that you know could we have just ignored it and just let it run its course and you know people point to sweden as an example of that they're a little bit of an unusual experiment because they're actually socially distanced anyway so i don't think they're a good model i think our best understanding if you look at the data is we have mitigated this not as well as we could but we've certainly done a reasonable job as david described uh, we can do better, and I think we will do better, and I'm excited to be part of that doing better and creating an environment that will be whatever the new environment is for us to live in and uh, to be human beings, which is what we all want to be. Absolutely. So, David, I'll, I'll wrap up with you, but I'm going to ask the same question about the next 12 to 18 months. But I'm going to throw a twist in as well and say that also it's a political, it's an election year, right, as well. So, you know, where are we at as far as leadership currently and where will we be with leadership, you know, in the next 12 or 18 months to get us through this? I'm not asking for a prediction, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, I think that the vaccine news is very good news. Uh, I've always been on the side of predicting an earlier vaccine. And in fact, I think that's going to be the case. Uh, with the Moderna phase one trials being successful, the Oxford vaccine showing antibody production in monkeys, Pfizer and others uh, coming out with very uh, encouraging results. I do think that we will probably have a vaccine that will be shown to be effective through phase three trials, probably by the end of this year. By the time that they are produced and commercialized in the amounts that we can have enough to immunize Americans uh, throughout the country, I think we're going to be looking at mid-2021. So uh, I think that we should plan on COVID being in our environments for the next 12 months. That's a pretty safe conservative bet. And uh, remember, when we're opening up areas, when we're going back to uh, more of a normal life, it's not saying it's because the COVID virus is going away. It's saying that should you need a hospital bed, there's enough hospital resources in your area to take care of you. And so this is still going to be a virus that we have to be concerned about, that we have to have the protections. And um, to think otherwise that we're returning to normal life for at least the next 12 months, I think is going to be foolish. Um, so, so in terms of the political implications of this, I think we are seeing the biggest gamble of um, the political elections uh, ever right now, because uh, with the president saying that we, this virus is going away, we should open up, we have to get this economy going. If there is not a bump in infection, and if we do not see a resurgence of uh, you know, the pandemic. Uh, I think the president will be helped by that. I think that that will uh, show that potentially many people will think that he was right, even whether they think he's handled this uh, pandemic well up to this point. But I think if there is a rebounding, if we see that people are being infected, more people are dying, that we have to close things back, I think that is a death blow for this administration. And which way it turns out, we really don't know because uh, right now we are seeing um, those states, as you mentioned, that have opened up, really not having a big resurgence of infections. So this is really a crapshoot that we're gonna be seeing. Uh, unfortunately, we're gambling with people's lives in many cases, so I hope that it turns out better than some people are predicting, like the IHME model that is predicting with the increased mobility of people, we're gonna see a tenfold increase of infections by August. I certainly hope that's not true, 
but recognize that that could be one of the outcomes. And I know I, I typically do this at the end of my webinars, so I come up with another question. I'm sorry, really quickly, but we'll do it. What role is data playing in this? It came from it came from one of our question Q and A's. Interesting. I always bring up just about every single time the company Kinza, right, that's out of San Francisco, that's putting thermometers out there to be able to get data. Um, do you think the CDC is kind of obsolete now as far as getting data from providers uh, and uh, uh, providers and doctors that are out there to be able to try to predict the wave of the flu or pandemics that are out there? The people that we're working with, the large, the large data companies that we're working with right now are looking for near real-time data so they can see these trends occurring in real time. What role do you see data playing in this, David, going forward? Well, I, I, I think that, you know, if we can get to real-time data, it will be much, much more helpful for us to identify when and if we're going to run into a problem again, not to repeat the same type of situation that we've seen. So the earlier that you can show and predict where a problem is occurring, the earlier that you can isolate that problem and prevent us from having to shut the economy down again. Uh, and so I think getting the real-time data makes sense. Now we are seeing, you know, you used a good example. I'm amazed by the examples that Google and Facebook are doing with real-time mobility data that we've built into some of these models that are predicting COVID infection. And so uh, the more that we can begin to get many of these data inputs integrated together to make uh, you know, more rational decisions, the better I think we're going to be. OK, that's great. Does anybody else have anything out, Nick or, or uh, Fred, anything else to contribute before we wrap up? I'd just add to David's comment that population health exists on the basis of data. You pull the data in, but I would not say, well, the CDC is old school or this and that. There's incredible expertise in that organization that we need to access, that we need those people to be doing what they do, whether the data is coming from Google or feeding into their system or anything else. That's a good point. Nick, anything else? Well. Uh, no, I mean, uh, data is the lifeblood of uh, all decision making. Um, you know, it was Lord Kelvin that said, without data, you can't make decisions. And if we don't have the uh, underlying information to be able to uh, use as a foundation, we're uh, flying blind at this point. Somebody asked, uh, you know, what's the, the sort of, where do you get this? I think we have to build up that capability. We've not done it. We failed to do it with electronic medical records. We created this morass of uh, disconnected information. There's been a number of uh, attempts to build that. Um, I think we have a good opportunity to do so. And if this is the watershed moment that drives that to success so that we have essentially a real-time capacity to uh, track and monitor and use that as the foundation, that's, you know, that's a silver lining from this uh, pandemic. Great, thank you. So I wanna thank uh, all of you for your great a contribution today on, uh, on helping people prep to go back to work. I also want to thank the audience for attending. Uh, we put a poll out there to kind of uh, uh, indicate what is the best time uh, to go through and have these webinars here in the future. Um, so uh, I want to just go ahead and wrap up and thank you know Dr. David Shulkin, uh, Dr. Uh, Van, uh, Nick Vanderheden, uh, and Fred Goldstein for participation and great insights as we prepare to go back to work and start defining the new normal in healthcare and our lives. I'm sorry that we weren't able to get to all questions. I think we did a pretty good job tonight, uh, but we will post the answers on life365.health and www.newnormal.buzz website, as well as recording of tonight's webinar. Uh, please be safe and healthy, and we look forward to having you join on our next webinar on next Wednesday, May 27th at 7 p.m. Eastern time, which is home care, uh, home and health care with COVID-19 with Dr. with sorry with Bob Roth from Honor out of San Francisco and Rear Admiral uh, Robert Ray CEO of Blue Star Senior Tech in the DC area. So have a great evening and thank you for attending. Thanks guys. Thank you.